the simplest solution to beating a drug test is just don't use. There are very few guarantees in life, but I can guarantee that if an individual doesn't use illicit drugs or the drugs that we're testing for, they're not going to test positive. So with that, let's get on with this uh, afternoon's agenda. There are three primary mechanisms by which people try to beat drug tests, and that is through whoops, and that's through dilution, basically diluting the sample, adulteration, somehow adultering the sample so there's going to test negative, and substitution. And, and I will discuss all three of those uh, uh, mechanisms. The first mechanism is dilution. And, and dilution is by far the most common method used to try to beat a drug test. You dilute the urine specimen, you dilute all the drugs that are in that specimen. There's one exception, ethanol. Alcohol cannot, al alcohol cannot be diluted out for, for a variety of reasons, which I'm not going to go into today. But dilution is by far the most common method used to beat a drug test. It's common knowledge that the, the, the more dilute the specimen is, the harder it is for us to detect anything in that uh, urine sample, despite the very, very sensitive uh, instrumentation that, uh, that we have. So how are specimens diluted? Well, one is pre-collection dilution. This is an individual consumes a large quantity of fluid prior to the collection. I often get asked the question, well, how much fluid does it take to get a dilute sample? And there's no easy, simple answer that, that applies across the board. Uh, because uh, a 300-pound linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks is going to require quite a bit more fluid than a 120-pound uh, cheerleader for the Seattle Seahawks to dilute their urine to the same extent. It just makes common sense that the larger the uh, individual's excuse me, in the individual's body, the more water it's going to take. But I have a rough rule of thumb. A rough rule of thumb is, for most people, if they're of average size, the consumption of anywhere from one and a half to two liters of water 45 to 60 minutes prior to an anticipated uh, collection of a urine sample, that is usually, in most cases, a sufficient quantity of water to get there, uh, uh, to dilute their sample. And then many times it will, they will result in a urine sample that has a creatinine of less than 20 milligrams per deciliter, which if you're trying to dilute your sample is not um, ideal. If you're trying to dilute your sample, you try to dilute it to a creatinine of 20.1 milligrams per deciliter so it doesn't get uh, uh, flagged. The second mechanism of uh, diluting a specimen is the addition of fluids to post-collection. That is, the individual urinates into a specimen cup, and then they add water to it. They may pour out some of the urine from the specimen cup, add water to it, and uh, dilute the specimen in that manner. That can be avoided uh, basically by doing um, an observed collection. It's going to be very difficult to add water to a sample if the collection is observed. So with that, let's get into the, uh, the meat of the subject. <clears throat> I'm going to make a statement. There is almost nothing that can be taken by mouth except water or other fluids that will result in a negative drug test. And there's, been, there's a lot of myths out there that, uh, that if you uh, drink a lot of water, soda, juice, coffee, or tea, that this will get you a negative uh, urine sample. And yes, that can get you a negative urine sample. And how, what's the mechanism uh, for this? It's basically it works by diluting the specimen, by drinking water, soda, juice, coffee, or tea. All of these are water-based uh, beverages. And if you drink a sufficient quantity of these beverages, you're going to dilute your specimen. And again, by uh, diluting the specimen, you're going to dilute uh, whatever uh, a drug might be in that uh, uh, specimen. So how do we tell what is a dilute specimen? Those of you who have uh, participated in some of the earlier webinars when I talked about uh, uh, creatinine, 
The definition of a dilute specimen is any specimen that has a creatinine level less than 20, whoops, less than 20 milligrams per deciliter. The slide, uh, the quality control on my editing of the slides is not very good. That should be milligrams per deciliter. Sorry, my apologies uh, for that. Any sample with a creatinine less than 20 milligrams per deciliter is considered a dilute uh, specimen. So if, if, if an individual is trying to consume fluids to dilute their specimen, uh, the goal is to keep the creatinine level above 20 milligrams per deciliter so it doesn't get flagged as, uh, as a dilute uh, specimen. Now, if you go on the internet and Google cleansing agents or how to beat a drug test, you'll come up with a multitude, a multitude of sites saying that they have uh, commercial cleansing agents or detoxifying agents, uh, urine cleansing agents. Uh, they come under a variety of names. And on this slide, I've got uh, three products that uh, I believe are still on the market. I recently looked this up on the internet there. There's Solution 4, Premium Detox, Absolute Detox. And again, uh, saying if you go and uh, uh, Google these agents, you'll find a myriad of, of products that are uh, out there. Uh, they're actually pretty, pretty expensive. Do these, uh, do these substance, do these cleansing agents work? Do these elixirs uh, work? And the answer is, uh, yes, they work, but not by the mechanism which the manufacturer uh, or the makers of these substances uh, claim. If you look at the instructions for these commercial cleansing agents, the instructions are, one, don't use drugs for two to four days prior to your anticipated uh, uh, urine specimen collection. So if someone is going in, knows that they're going in for a pre-employment uh, drug collection, uh, the, the advice is don't use drugs for two to four days prior to the anticipated uh, uh, collection. Two, drink the detoxifying solution. What's actually in these uh, uh, cleansing agents, uh, I really don't know. I've never uh, uh, actually tried them or even looked at them, but I suspect what they have, they're water-based. They probably have some vitamins to make it a fancy color, may have food dyes, probably have some electrolytes. Uh, amino acids uh, to make it kind of look uh, look pretty. So the instructions are don't use drugs for two to four days, drink detoxifying solution for two to three days prior to the collection, and drink water on the day of the test, but the caution is don't drink too much water so you don't dilute your sample. So how do these commercial cleansing agents work? Do they have some kind of a magic power or magic elixir or magic ingredient? No, unfortunately, they don't. The, they really work by uh, suggesting that uh, an individual be abstinent from drug use, and the second mechan mechanism is in uh, uh, dilution. You know, drink their solution, uh, drink a lot of water on the test day, and by abstaining for, from using drugs for two to four days, many, if not most, with the exception of maybe THC, most of the drugs will be cleared out of their system in that two to four days of uh, abstinence. So these cleansing agents uh, don't really work. Yes, if you follow their instructions, there's a very good chance that you'll test negative, but it's not due to any magic um, uh, power or any magic ingredients that are in that cleansing solution. They really work through abstinence and dilution. And we can uh, determine dilution because we perform a creatinine test on every specimen that comes into the laboratory. So we will tell you what the creatinine level is. If the creatinine level is less than 20, uh, we will either label it as dilute or low, and there'll be a caution, cautionary statement uh, regarding the interpretation of negative screening results. The second mechanism is by adulteration, by uh, adding something to the uh, to the specimen. Now, a, a, a variant of adulteration is by ingesting uh, water with added uh, ingredients or added substances. And if, if you look on the internet and you talk to people, they say, well, if you mix uh, uh, a 
couple of tablespoonfuls of vinegar into a glass of water and drink that, you'll end up with a negative drug test. Uh, bleach, pectin, pectin is the substance that's used to solidify jams and uh, jellies. Uh, cranberry juice, these are just some uh, examples um, of, of things that have been recommended. If you, if you consume these, that these will uh, somehow, in, in some magical manner, uh, result in negative drug uh, test. In fact, it's, it's, it's not true. There's no magic uh, power of vinegar, bleach, pectin, or cranberry juice. Actually, adding a couple tablespoons of bleach to a glass of water uh, really is not a very good idea. Bleach is very uh, caustic. Uh, it irritates the lining of the stomach and actually can be pretty dangerous if, uh, if you do that. Now, people who try these mechanisms and say that they tested negative, how does it work? It works primarily by diluting the sample because if you're going to drink a vinegar solution, you're going to drink a lot of water in excess to try to dilute out the vinegar. Same thing with uh, bleach, same thing with pectin. Uh, cranberry juice is primarily uh, uh, water. So the mechanism that these work by is dilution. Now. <clears throat> There is one substance, and this is something that has come to light uh, very recently. The excretion of certain drugs are dependent upon pH. An example of that is methamphetamine and amphetamine. The excretion of these two drugs are pH dependent. Under alkaline conditions, that is the urine is, is basic with a pH uh, in excess of uh, 7, under alkaline, alkaline conditions, methamphetamine and amphetamine excretion rate is reduced, meaning that the amount of uh, drug that's excreted through the urine is reduced. So the ingestion of very large amounts of baking soda with, along with water reduces the excretion rate of amphetamine and methamphetamine. And if it reduces the excretion rate sufficiently, the concentration of these drugs will be sufficiently low in a urine sample that uh, they're going to be below the cutoff for positivity. They're going to be below the threshold for positivity. And so uh, they, that will result in negative screening tests. Now, the amount of baking soda that's required is very, very large. The anecdotal uh, stories that I have heard is people will add a couple of tablespoonfuls of baking soda to a glass of water. They will drink it. They drink the uh, baking soda solution. They don't usually feel very good. Uh, in addition to that, they'll consume a large amount of, uh, of water. And it, it does work. By making the urine alkaline, the excretion rate of amphetamine and methamphetamine is going to be severely, severely reduced. And uh, the levels may be sufficiently low that we can't pick them up uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a screening test. Uh, people ask me, well, won't that affect the pH of the urine? Yes, it will make the pH of the urine alkaline, but, it, but the, the pH of the urine will still be within normal limits, those normal limits being 4.5 to 8.9 pH unit. Uh, urine typically, the average urine sample is typically is slightly on the acidic side, so the addition of uh, 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 bicarbonate of soda or baking soda will increase the pH, but it will not be greater than 8.9. The anecdotal stories that I've heard, some people who have tried this approach uh, feel very, very sick. It's a very, very uncomfortable feeling to ingest this amount of uh, baking soda. Uh, one way to avoid this situation is if, if you're concerned about someone using baking soda to try to uh, mask or eliminate or reduce the, the elimination rate of amphetamine and methamphetamine, one thing you can do is use an alternative matrix. Use a oral fluid collection device. Collect an oral fluid. The pH uh, uh, from the baking soda will not affect the pH of blood, and so the uh, transport of amphetamine into and methamphetamine into oral fluid is not uh, affected. 
Now, a, a, a common form of adulteration, and, and this is not very common today. We don't see a whole lot of adulteration of samples because we've got uh, tests that can pick these up. But uh, one of the first uh, compounds that was noted to, the, that was determined to cause negative testing results was the addition of visine. Visine is, uh, uh, visine are eye drops that are used to help people have a red eye or their eyes are dry. There is a, uh, a, an oxidizing agent in visine, I think it may actually be a preservative, which will oxidize THC. And, and visine was one of the first compounds to be noted that if visine was added to a urine sample, added to the urine sample post-collection, that this would uh, result in negative uh, screening tests for, for marijuana, basically for THC uh, carboxy. There are other compounds that can be added to urine sample. These are collectively called uh, oxidants, and they will oxidize the compounds that we're interested in measuring, and this will result in negative screening results. The compounds that uh, are commonly added are chromate salts, uh, salts of uh, iodates, iodic acid, nitrites, hydrogen peroxide, pyridinium chloral uh, chromate. All of these compounds, with the exception of visine, can be detected using a general oxidant uh, screen. Now, we don't see very many positive samples with positive uh, oxidant activity because we're pretty good at picking them up and uh, uh, people just don't use them very much. You know, having said that, uh, about approximately two weeks ago, we did have a specimen at our Flagstaff uh, laboratory that tested positive for oxidants, and we were able to determine that it actually contained pyridinium chlorochromate, or PCC. Uh, this was a non-observed collection, and the donor of that sample had uh, slipped some pyridinium chlorochromate into that sample. All of the uh, screening tests were negative, probably because of the addition of the PCC to that uh, particular sample, but we were able to detect it with our oxidant test, and then we did some further tests to uh, pinpoint exactly what was there. Now, other agents, which, which I'll call masking agents, have been, can also be added to uh, urine specimens in an attempt to uh, beat the test or, or uh, somehow mask the positivity. Uh, surfactants, like soap. Uh, a common addition is dishwashing soap that has uh, some kind of a citrusy scent that's been um, added to these samples. We actually have a test for soap for surfactants, but you can almost tell that a specimen has soap, but if you shake the specimen up a little bit, it, there's excessive foaming. Now, that's not definitive, obviously, but we do have a, a chemical test for the presence of uh, soap. Another common adulterant is the addition of sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide will make the urine extremely, extremely alkaline, and a common source of sodium hydroxide are Drano pellets. Drano is, as, as most people know, is uh, a chemical that you pour down the drain to uh, unclog your uh, pipes. But uh, uh, small bits of Drano pellets can be added to a urine sample. This will increase the pH. This will invalidate the screening assays. But we perform pH testing on samples, and addition of Drano will cause the urine sample to be sufficiently alkaline that we will pick that up on our pH test. Um, acid can also be added to a urine specimen. This will decrease the pH. A common source of acid is uh, hydrochloric acid in the form of uh, pool acid that's used in uh, swimming pools. Vinegar is another uh, source of uh, acid. The addition of vinegar can be detected. You don't even need a uh, chemical test or a test for pH. Uh, vinegar can be detected through uh, an olfactory test. It's very simple to, to uh, smell vinegar. Vinegar has obviously a very distinctive uh, odor. Glutaraldehyde, which is a protein fixative, has been added to uh, specimens. 
what the glutaraldehyde does is it acts actually on the reagents that are used for the screening test and, and validates them. And if someone and, and if glutaraldehyde is added to a specimen, the absorbance readings that we get from our automated screening instruments are give us an indication that uh, something is not quite uh, quite normal. So glutaraldehyde is easy to detect that way. Plus, we have some spot tests for uh, glutaraldehyde that we can identify that. There's something that has just very, very recently been reported, and this is the addition of, of uh, uh, zinc salt, something like zinc sulfate, uh, zinc nitrate. Uh, these can be uh, zinc salts that can be added to a specimen post-collection, or they can actually be through the ingestion of large large amounts of uh, zinc salts uh, orally, and then they're they're rapidly uh, eliminated, and the presence of uh, zinc salts will invalidate a lot of the uh, screening assays and will result in negative screening test. There are some commercial products out on the marketplace, and one of these commercial products is you're in luck. You are in luck if you use this uh, this material. This stuff is designed to be added to urine samples post-collection, and there are various formulations of uh, urine luck. If we look at my compilation here, uh, urine luck formula 6.3 uh, has some kind of an acid and a uh, fluoride in there. Uh, urine luck 6.4 had uh, acid, fluorine, and nitrite. Nitrite, as we recall, is an oxidizing agent. Uh, urine luck 6.6 6, version 6.5 had acid, iodine, and uh, fluorine. And I don't know what the current version of urine luck that's out on the uh, marketplace has. It's uh, urine 6.xx. I don't know exactly what version of urine luck uh, is out there in the marketplace now. Uh, but there are many, many uh, types of products uh, like this. And the question is, do they work? Yes, in fact, uh, they do work. And they work by either oxidizing the compounds that we're interested in uh, measuring, or they somehow inactivate the amino assays that we used for our, uh, our screening test. There's a large, large variety of these products out on the marketplace. Urine Luck is just uh, uh, one of them. I'd just like to add that we don't see very many samples that are adulterated because we're actually very good at picking, uh, picking up these samples. And we pick them up by visual examination of the specimen. When we take the lid off the specimen, if there's an abnormal odor, that's noted. And then we have biochemical tests where we look for uh, oxidants and, uh, and pH. So we, we still get a smattering of uh, samples that have been adulterated, but not nearly as many as we did, say, maybe 10, uh, 10 12 years ago. Substitution. Substitution now is one of the more common ways to try to get around uh, uh, or how, how, to, how, to, how to get negative uh, uh, results. And as I said earlier, substitution is now much more prevalent than adulteration. What I mean by substitution is substituting either synthetic or artificial urine for their own specimen, uh, substituting donor urine for their own specimen. The donor urine could be, quite often, it, it uh, uh, can be a child or could be their own urine when they're not using any drug, or it can be from a friend who is not using drugs uh, at the moment. So substitution is basically substituting someone else's urine for their own. And the third mechanism is animal urine. Animal urine is very, very difficult for us to uh, uh, tell apart from human urine. The more common animal urines that add dog urine is, is one very common uh, uh, substitute. Now, <clears throat> substitution of synthetic donor or animal urine can be, printed, can be prevented by uh, observed collections. Now, if people have asked me, well, can, can, I, tell, can I tell the difference between uh, human urine and animal urine? And the answer is not easily, 
but yes, there are tests that can distinguish uh, uh, animal urine like dog or uh, other, other animals from human urine, but it's very, very expensive. So it really depends upon how much you're willing to pay for us to tell uh, whether this sample is human urine or whether it is of animal uh, nature. To get to the topic of synthetic or uh, artificial urine, if you, again, uh, go on the internet and Google artificial urine or synthetic urine, you're going to get dozens and dozens of uh, hits. There are many companies out there that are willing to sell synthetic urine or artificial urine. Uh, this slide just shows three of these uh, products. One is called Quick Fix. Uh, one is called Ultra Pure. And I can't read the name of the other uh, uh, product. Uh, these artificial or synthetic urines uh, contain creatinine. They contain sufficient creatinine that uh, uh, when we do a creatinine test, the levels are normal. They contain urea. They contain electrolytes. They contain phosphates. The pH is adjusted, so it's within the normal range. And they typically add a, a yellow dye to the samples to make them look uh, uh, like natural urine. When you see these synthetic urine samples and you take a look at them, uh, they don't quite look like normal urine. The color is off. Uh, when you shake them, they don't foam. They don't have a distinctive odor of uh, urine. Uh, but the way we can detect synthetic urines is we actually have a test in our Tacoma laboratory uh, to detect uh, urine that is not consistent with normal human urine, and we look for some constituents that are uh, present in all normal human urine samples but are lacking in some of the artificial urine samples. However, the manufacturers of these compounds have gotten uh, fairly uh, clever and are actually adding some of the constituents that we use to uh, measure. How prevalent is substitution of, of uh, artificial urine? Um, we don't actually know, but a number of years ago, we did an informal study of substituted specimens. I looked at 678 specimens that were uh, sent to the, our Tacoma laboratory for pre-employment uh, testing. Uh, all of these samples were, were, were non-observed collections. All of the screening results on these specimens were, uh, were negative. And when we applied, the, when, when we performed our synthetic or artificial urine test on these specimens, we were able to determine that approximately 7% of 678 specimens were synthetic urine or artificial urine. 7%. That is a absolutely huge, huge number of samples that were uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, urine samples. Uh, donor urine, I, I talked a little bit about this uh, earlier. Donor urine quite often can be from a, from a child who we, we would assume are not using drugs. The urine can be from themselves or from a friend who's not uh, urine, who, who's, who's not using uh, drugs. Uh, the substituted samples can be smuggled into the, the, the collection area. Uh, it's not unusual to hide it in, uh, in, in underwear, uh, tape it to their thigh, uh, very, various uh, schemes. Uh, occasionally a sample of artificial urine or donor urine will be inserted into a body cavity and then, uh, then released. There are devices on the uh, marketplace. There's something called a Wizenator. A Wizenator is a latex male prosthetic device that uh, from a distance looks like the, the real deal. And artificial or synthetic urine can be introduced into this device. It's, it's heated to uh, uh, body temperature by uh, heat packs. And from a distance, it looks like the real deal. Uh, there are also uh, plastic storage bags that uh, have uh, plastic tubing. Uh, it, it 
in the plastic tubing contains either synthetic urine or donor urine, uh, and it's introduced into the specimen uh, uh, collection cup. Uh, many, many years ago, I had a telephone call from the secretary of the Washington State Horse Racing Commission and called and asked uh, if we had a test for water at the laboratory. And I thought that was a very, very um, interesting uh, question. I'd never had that question asked before. And I said, and my question to the individual was, why are you interested in a test for water? And he told me the story that they had a, uh, a jockey uh, who had previously tested positive, and he was basically on his last uh, uh, last chance. Uh, and he showed up at a collection site wearing very, very bulky uh, sweatpants, very, very bulky uh, sweatshirt. He came in and uh, was asked to, to uh, provide a urine sample. This was a unobserved uh, collection. He provided a urine sample. The uh, collector looked at the sample and said, gee, this doesn't look like urine. This kind of looks like water, which then prompted the telephone call to the laboratory. And I said, oh, I know what you want. You don't need a test for water. You just need for me to be able to tell you that this isn't consistent with normal human urine. And the secretary said, yeah, that's what we need. That's what we need. So the sample was sent in to us. And uh, I don't know if it was water, but it certainly was not consistent with normal human uh, 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 urine. Well, there's more to the story than that. Since he was wearing very bulky sweats, uh, sweatshirt, very bulky sweatpants, they asked him to uh, raise his sweatshirt, and taped to his back was a plastic bag that had a tube running uh, down his back and down his leg. It was taped to his thigh, and so the sample that went into the specimen cup was actually the contents of that uh, plastic bag. So I assume he was uh, busted and lost his uh, privileges at the uh, uh, horse track. It's just an example of some of the things that we've seen. Uh, people will resort to all sorts of things to try to, to, get, a, to, to uh, get negative test results on a, a urine sample. The last thing that uh, we hear about every now and then is self-catheterization. This is the way the situation works. An individual will empty their bladder. They will then catheterize themselves and inject either synthetic urine or uh, negative urine into the bladder. And when it comes time to uh, uh, submit a sample, they will urinate in the normal fashion. Whether this, and if it's an observed collection, the urine seems to be exiting from the appropriate uh, anatomical site, and there's really no way to tell if an individual has catheterized himself and then is substituting either uh, uh, donor urine or artificial urine. This seems like a rather uh, a dramatic way to get negative test results, but uh, it's not unheard of. We hear about it happening uh, quite, quite uh, frequently. So it's a rather extreme measure, but uh, it does uh, does happen. So uh, how do we prevent drug test uh, uh, cheating? Well, the one of the most effective ways of preventing cheating or cheaters, catching cheaters, is to do an observed collection. I can't emphasize the importance of a diligently observed urine collection. If, if, a, a collect, if, if the collection is uh, observed, it's, it's very easy to prevent addition of water to the sample. It's relatively easy to detect substitution of the sample or the addition of any kind of a uh, adulterate, adulterant into that particular uh, uh, urine sample. Now, I understand that under certain circumstances, observed collections are not possible, or according to some regulations, they're not always allowed. So if you can't do an observed collection, there are still things that uh, can be done to uh, prevent uh, cheating. Uh, one is to, after the sample has been uh, submitted, Look at the temperature strip. The temperature strip should register between 90 and 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. 
if the temperature is on the low end, uh, below 90 or above 100, it will not register on that strip. And if the temperature is outside of the normal range, then one can suspect uh, either substitution or some sort of tampering with that particular uh, specimen. And the thing that you can do uh, at that point is to ask for another uh, specimen. The other thing you can do is look for unusual color in a, in a specimen. The synthetic urines, uh, the artificial urines, even though they may have a yellow dye added to them, they don't quite look like a normal urine sample. So if you suspect it may not be uh, a normal urine, you can always ask for another specimen, and hopefully they, they don't have any, any of the synthetic or the artificial urine uh, left. If there's an unusual odor to the particular uh, sample, this is a uh, kind of a sign that something else, something may have been added to that sample. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, smell the sample because the, the collector may have already put the lid on the specimen uh, uh, collector. Uh, look for unusual behavior. If it's taking an abnormally long time to produce a sample, this may be an indication that uh, they're, they're, they're trying to pull a uh, fast one uh, on you. If it's an unobserved collection, you know, one of the things to do is to add the blue dye to the toilet bowl so they can't get water out of the toilet bowl. If you can, shut the water off to the lavatory so that they can't add water to the specimen from, from a faucet. They could always add uh, hot water to the sample and they might register in the appropriate temperature uh, range. Other thing you can do is stand outside the bathroom door and listen to see if uh, sound of running water or anything uh, abnormal. So any sort of unusual behavior is kind of a clue that uh, the donor may be up to some sort of uh, uh, hijinks or tricks in an attempt to uh, defraud. Now, uh, one way, if, if you do suspect something, it would be the possibility of uh, collecting an alternative matrix. And the alternative matrix that I would recommend is oral fluid. In, in cases where you can't collect a urine sample, in cases where you suspect that uh, some sort of a tampering or substitution may be occurring, uh, oral fluid is a, a very, al very good alternative matrix to a urine sample. Oral fluids are very difficult to dilute. There's nothing to dilute, dilute with dilute them. It's very difficult to uh, uh, substitute uh, oral fluid because all oral fluid collections are uh, almost by definition they are observed collections and it's very very difficult to adulterate an oral fluid sample it's very difficult to add any kind of a foreign substance to it that would negate any type of a uh, uh, screening test so uh, if, if you suspect any kind of tampering with an with a urine sample then you might consider an alternative uh, matrix and I would suggest uh, oral fluid as an alternative uh, matrix.